你。Sorry for the, the slow start. Um, okay, so we've been talking about uh, parallel databases for the last uh, couple of days. Uh, we talked about uh, dealing with parallelism uh, in a static context. Uh, part of that was um, coming up with various algorithms for, for doing um, things like sorts and, and what have you on uh, the data. Uh, one of the things we talked about yesterday, uh, Monday, Wednesday, uh, was this idea of bloom joints. Uh, which allow you to, um, which basically rely on a, a technique called bloom filters uh, that allow you to summarize sets uh, and create sort of a sketch uh, that will allow you to pre-filter some uh, tuples uh, before sending them over to a different uh, node participating in, in a quality test. Um, we also started talking about uh, distributed transactions. Uh, we talked about uh, basically the, the challenges of, um, we, we started talking uh, about the, the challenges of updating objects across multiple nodes. And one of the main challenges, or the two main challenges, are providing isolation. So all of the, uh, the, the, the nodes participating in that distributed computation uh, have to essentially agree on what, uh, what sequence of operations um, affect those sites. And uh, there's a challenge related to durability uh, because now we can have failures that occur on some but not all of the sites participating in, in the distributed computation. Uh, we talked mainly about isolation uh, on Wednesday, uh, so now we're going to move on uh, to durability. So the big challenge in durability is that um, there are uh, new kinds, new ways in which the system can fail. If a traditional database system fails, it's working, it's operating on a single node. If that one node uh, goes down, well, the entire node has gone down, and the entire node can initiate recovery. Um, but now that we have many nodes, uh, one or more of those nodes could fail while the others continue which means we need a, a recovery strategy that keeps in mind that some of the nodes uh, may not necessarily have, have failed. Uh, there's also a possibility that uh, various uh, things can happen to the network, and so one node might lose connectivity to other nodes. And if that happens, uh, the, both of the nodes are still running, which uh, both of the nodes are still running, and each of them might think that the other node uh, has failed uh, when, in fact, uh, it's simply disconnected, so we need to be able to deal with that as well. And ultimately, this all boils down to a question of when is it safe to say uh, that at least some of the nodes, uh, regardless of failure, will, uh, sorry, when is it safe to say that all of the nodes are happy with the, the uh, are, are ready to commit? And the fundamental strategy uh, for that is this uh, is a protocol called two-phase commit. And in two-phase commit, um, like two-phase locking, uh, it consists of two phases. Um, in the first phase, we're going to, well, actually, let me back up a step. So we could, naively speaking, make sure that no sites can um, We can make sure that all of the sites are, uh, will never uh, enter a situation uh, where they're unable to commit. Uh, in other words, uh, we use very aggressive locking, we use very aggressive um, uh, intersite coordination to make sure that any time an update occurs, 
uh, on one site, all of the other sites know about it and are ready to, to, to deal with that. Um, unfortunately, that, that's basically going to be infeasible. It's, it leads to uh, lots of communication and uh, essentially lots of blocking. Uh, so as, as a slightly uh, more general strategy, what we can do is allow the sites to get out of, out of sync. Uh, and just like we do optimistic concurrent, just like in optimistic concurrency control, um, at the very end of the transaction, we can val validate that all of the sites are, are safe, are, are able to commit successfully. Now, once they're able to, uh, once we, we know that the sites are, are able and, and ready to commit, uh, we can then we can do some sort of critical section uh, oper style operations. Uh, we, we can force those sites to coordinate, uh, but only when the transaction is ready to commit. So we're going to, the, the two-phase commit protocol uh, proceeds in, in two phases. In the first phase, we're going to notify all of the sites that we want to commit. Each site is going to locally decide whether or not it's safe to commit, and at the same time, it will, will sort of restrict itself uh, from uh, agreeing to commit any other uh, transaction that could potentially create a conflict. Now, once all of the sites have agreed to commit, or at least uh, either once, once all of the sites have agreed to commit, or once at least one site has uh, decided that an abort is necessary, uh, then we can communicate that information to all of the sites. And it, essentially, once, once that happens, the sites actually finalize the commit process or the abort process. And sort of the, the key to this is that as soon as phase one completes, um, each site has essentially signed itself uh, and, and committed uh, to being able to commit, um, or it's informed the coordinator that it needs to abort. Uh, is the uh, optimistic concurrency uh, control? Uh, it usually uses, uh, yes, optimistic concurrency control. So uh, in phase one or phase two, to do the uh, validation. So validation happens at, uh, in phase one before the node uh, agrees to commit. So the, the basically once once the node sends the coordinator a, a commit message, uh, it has essentially committed itself to to being able to commit. So in two phase commit, uh, one site will be selected as a coordinator, and all of the other sites. Uh, will act as sub subordinates. Uh, how, how the coordinator is selected? Well, there's a variety of different protocols. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you about any of those. Usually it's random. Um, one simple strategy is to pick the, the site with the lowest IP. Um, each transaction has to have exactly one coordinator, um, although different transactions can have different coordinators. Uh, the, the reason for this is that the coordinator uh, basically needs to know all of the information about that one transaction, whereas the individual sites can figure out which... Uh, the, the conflict detection between transactions happens at the individual sites, but the decision uh, whether or not to uh, commit a particular transaction has to happen at a single site. We need all of the information from all of the sites in order, in order to do that. Uh, if a different transaction... Uh, a different, uh, when do the, uh, validation? So the validation happens at the individual sites. Each site validates um, whatever operations happened locally. So if uh, um, the validation is uh, Not necessarily. Um, the other. But uh, the local side, how do you how know? So the, the court, uh, you can do things uh, like timestamp-based optimistic concurrency control, where the coordinator just needs to select a timestamp, send it out to each of the, uh, assign it to the transaction. For the validation only needed to operate on the local. Yeah, so each site can locally, uh, in, in two-phase commit, each site will locally decide whether or not the transaction is okay to commit. Uh, you can. You can do that by having the sites send weights for graphs to each other. You can have that done by the, the sites using a timestamp to ensure that uh, the transactions are, are uh, 
uh, executed in order. One way or another, uh, the site kit will how the site figures out locally that the transaction is is commit worthy is up to the the underlying system. Uh, the two-phase commit protocol simply relies on the site having some ability to figure out whether uh, it's local, uh, whether any impact the transaction has had on the site's local state will affect uh, its ability to commit. So each site locally, basically you want to ensure that each site locally dis uh, has the ability to decide um, whether or not the commit can, can complete. So, uh, the basic protocol goes as so. Uh, the coordinator will start out by um, logging uh, by, so each site is going to have a log uh, that it's going to use, kind of like the, the right ahead log we used when talking about the Aries protocol. Uh, so the coordinator is going to start out by logging a prepare statement for the transaction in question. And it will send uh, a message to each subordinate saying, uh, prepare the transaction for commit. As soon as the subordinate receives that, that uh, statement, it'll basically decide locally, do I, uh, is, is there any conflict on my local state uh, coming from this transaction? Um, if it does, uh, as soon as it do does that, it will send a message either commit or abort the, the coordinator. Um, as far as any subsequent decisions go, uh, the, the subordinate will treat that transaction as if it, it had committed. So if there's a conflict with another transaction, uh, that if, two trans if the site is trying to uh, prepare two transactions, it'll prepare one of them, and then when it prepares the second, it will treat the first as if it had committed for the purposes of, of detecting conflicts. It will log this message locally as well. So it will either log that the transaction is prepared, or if it decides to abort, it will immediately log the abort. Um, when we get to recovery, we'll, um, something to keep in the back of your heads for a couple of slides, uh, why is it okay for the transaction, for the site to immediately uh, decide that it's safe to abort? I'll get back to that in a couple of slides. And as soon as the, uh, the subordinate decides whether or not it will log it, and then it will send back a message to the coordinator saying, yes, it's okay to commit, or no, I would like to abort. If the coordinator receives a no from any subordinate, it will tell all of the subordinates to abort. And in this particular case, if uh, any of the subordinates uh, fail or, or uh, somehow uh, lose the ability to communicate with the coordinator, then uh, the coordinator can simply make an assumption that that particular uh, subordinate has failed, and it will treat that, uh, that as a no. Um, so basically, if, if it doesn't receive a yes response within some specified time frame, it'll just abort the entire transaction. And again, uh, keep in mind why that's okay. As soon as it receives uh, an agreement to, uh, to commit from all of the transactions, it'll, uh, it'll then tell all of the subordinates, okay, it is now safe to commit. And before, but before it does that, it will log a message to local storage saying, okay, uh, I have decided to commit this transaction, or I've decided to abort this transaction. Um, the sub uh, locally, the, each subordinate then will, will perform either the abort or the commit, um, basically as a single site operation. So each of these, these uh, we, we talked pretty extensively, extensively about right ahead logging and the ARIES protocol. Um, basically, that's what happens at each site now. Um, yeah. And as soon as it finishes doing so, it's going to let the coordinator know that it's done. And the transaction is completely ready to proceed uh, as soon as the coordinator uh, re has received an acknowledgement from all of the, all of the part participating nodes. Is that clear? All right, 
so yeah. uh, this is no implication between the no no root uh, curve between the sides. Sorry, could you uh, speak a little louder? Uh, no implication data across the sides. Uh, this actually encompasses both replication and partitioning. Um, so the, the question is, uh, this, uh, does, this, uh, does this include replication? And the answer is, um, it can. So if you have, if you have a replication, if you modify y, uh, ruby curve on one side, you can only deal with the other side. So you can, you can treat replication I'll, I'll get back to this towards the end of the presentation, but the, um, the simple solution is to treat each replica as a different object modified by the transaction. Okay. So have the transact, basically you, you treat it as two separate sites that each need to participate in the two-phase commit protocol. If one site, uh, granted these sites will, will behave in completely identical ways, and we can take advantage of that. But uh, the, the naive solution is to simply treat each of them as, as a separate uh, entity modified. Uh, any, any operations the transaction performs on one of them, it performs exactly the same set of operations on the other. Is that, does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So now we move on to the interactive portion of, of this. Uh, Really, really high level, what the next couple of slides were, that we're going to talk about is basically every, every single one of the, the failure cases that we could possibly deal with. And uh, we're going to talk, uh, and now I'm, I'm going to try and get you to, uh, to uh, lead this. Uh, and basically we're going to try and, and uh, talk about what happens in each of these failure cases. So let's let's start from um, the very top. The uh, there's some sort of network uh, network fabric that allows each of the nodes to communicate, and that network fabric has suddenly undergone some sort of failure that prevents some nodes from communicating to some other nodes. How do we treat that, or what would be a, a reasonable response to that? And let's start off with what happens if two uh, subordinates stop being able to talk to each other. They won't be any message and Okay, so the subordinates can never talk to one another, or ne uh, in this protocol, never talk to one another, so that's not a problem. What happens is if a subordinate uh, loses the ability to talk to a uh, to the coordinator? It will always support the transaction because okay, so it's, it'll it can time uh, the coordinator time. can can time out. Um, is there so from the coordinator's perspective? Is there a difference between um, the node losing communication with the node and the node just outright failing? Yeah. Using time, also you can decide. Well, you so you can. Well, in both cases, the node is going to stop responding. It'll stop responding until the problem is resolved. If the node, the node will eventually come back up, or the node will eventually regain communication. So, is there a difference between those two cases? No. no. Okay. So, uh, because all of this computation is more or less centralized, uh, we can essentially treat uh, a net split as a failure. And we'll uh, talk a bit about uh, a couple more slides. We'll get back to how do we deal with uh, a subordinate failure. All right, next question. Um, what happens if the coordinator crashes? And specifically, what happens if it crashes in phase one while it's preparing? So what are the possible cases? Or what, what happens in phase one? Uh, Okay, so the subordinates lose uh, lose contact with the coordinator. So the coordinator um, will crash, and the subordinates are not driving the, the transaction. They, they, 
they don't communicate with each other. They, the only thing that they can communicate with is, is the coordinator. And you're right, if the coordinator crashes in phase one, uh, the, the subordinates can have their own timeouts. And if the timeouts elapses, then uh, they, can, they can abort the transaction pre uh, preemptively. Uh, but the coordinator could just as easily uh, come up before the time, uh, restart before the timeout happens. So what happens if, if the coordinator uh, dies but then restarts? So what does uh, what does the coordinator do locally? What what are the steps uh, that the coordinator? Sorry. Use a log. Okay, so it, it, it logs. What does it log? It contains a set of operations that the transaction should uh, execute. Uh, the, so the, that will uh, the individual operations on the data objects will typically be at the, the individual sites. So the, the coordinator won't store a log of all of the operations that the transaction has performed. But the... Uh, the okay, so um, we don't necessarily have to be using logging here, but what is the coordinator... Uh, what is the coordinator... It knows who to which someone is it sent to Okay, so it's logged a prepare message. Um, okay, it's also potentially sent out a bunch of prepare messages. Um, what is, okay, so now the transaction fails, uh, sorry, the, the coordinator, um, the coordinator uh, dies, it loses some information. It, it loses information about the, the transaction, it loses information uh, about which, so it hasn't uh, explicitly logged which, um, which clients have received uh, a prepare message, or which clients have been sent a prepare message. But um, is that okay? So, so is, is it okay that the, the it's essentially lost a record of the transaction? Or, or essentially what state that transaction is in? I guess this goes back to, to your comment. Uh, essentially, yes, uh, the, the information uh, ne can't necessarily be recovered, but it doesn't need to be because the coordinator, uh, if the coordinator fails, it can simply, dis when it comes back up, it can simply decide to abort all of the, the client, uh, sorry, it can simply decide to abort all of the transactions that were running at the time of the crash. This, this is essentially like what happens in, um, in the Ares protocol when the entire system crashes. Why, why the letter model? So if the if the coordinator is logged, it can also uh, so, sorry. so the coordinator can also log the prepare message, and if it does so, it will it uh, could just as easily. Um, so the, the the problem with so what happens if a client responds to the coordinator with a yes or a no while the coordinator has crashed? So essentially, the coordinator will have lo uh, there is a potential that the coordinator could have lost messages uh, while it was not running. Now it could resend. Uh, it, 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 it could uh, certainly resend requests for commit or abort, uh, in which case it could recover the transaction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Moving on. Um, Okay, so the coordinator, a coordinator crash in phase one, either information was logged and the coordinator can resume the transaction, or the coordinator can simply decide to abort the transaction as if it had never happened. Uh, but, okay, now in phase two, uh, the clients have essentially agreed to commit the transaction. Um, what happens if uh, the coordinator crashes in phase two? Start out with what information uh, does the coordinator does the coordinator lose? Information about so what information does the coordinator have? Uh, I guess let's let's start with the uh, what causes what is the the single event that causes a transition from phase one to phase two? 
Okay, so the all of the subordinates respond with a yes, and then. Coming decision is made. Final decision. Okay, so the coordinator makes a final decision, and how does it make that decision permanent? By logging it. Yes. So the the single event that causes. Uh, The single event that causes a transition from state uh, phase one to phase two is logging that particular event. As soon as it's logged, then the, the coordinator can uh, recover and know that it's in phase two. Um, now, what's, what's the next thing that the coordinator would do? Okay, so it, uh, it then, uh, after it logs the, uh, logs the event, it sends uh, yes or no to all of the, the subordinates. Uh, is it okay for it to, uh, to redo that? Yes. Yes. So uh, the, the support, if a subordinate receives a uh, yes, you should commit, or a no, you should abort, uh, why is that okay? Or uh, receives two uh, such messages for the same transaction. Why is that going to be okay? Why? why Okay, so it discards the new message, but uh, do you, what, uh, can, can we, okay, so it's, it's okay for it to do that, uh, essentially because the, uh, the coordinator will, um, will never resend uh, two different messages. It'll always be the same message. So the client receives, uh, there won't be a situation where the coordinator first sends out, um, I will commit, uh, and, and then later sends out, I will abort, uh, because Always, it, the log record will always bring it back to the same state. Uh, what happens if? Uh, right. yeah. uh, so um, let's move on to the subordinates. So each subordinate uh, could potentially crash in phase one. What, uh, this is actually identical to it being uh, partitioned away. But what happens if a subordinate crashes in phase one? What does is, what is a, a subordinate do in phase one? Speak up. Okay, so it answers the prepare message. Um, and what does it do uh, in order to do that? Or what, what, what does it do before it answers the prepare message? What, do you, what do we always do in, in Aries? Log. Log, yes. So everything gets logged. Um, and it will. So, basically, what data do we lose? So, what data could we potentially uh, lose? Has uh, have the transactions changes uh, been necessarily actually written to disk? Will they be recovered? Uh, will they be recovered? However, yes. So, how, how do we how do we ensure that? By redoing the okay, so how do we ensure that the log goes all the way up to the uh, the the point that? But how how do we ensure that the log covers everything uh, up to the point that the crash occurred, or at least up to the point that the uh, prepare got answered? Look for the previous commit or log. Well, so it, uh, <coughs> essentially, yeah. So we 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 make sure that um, we. Flush everything to disk. But uh, the the prepare message uh, gets written out. Uh, when the prepare message gets flushed to disk, we need to flush everything before it in the log as well. So that essentially ensures that as soon as that prepare message gets written out, we can always recover up to that point, up to the point that the prepare message uh, was written out. Uh, what happens if uh, it crashes after an abort decision? Yeah, what happens if it decides to respond with an abort? Is it okay for it to crash at that point? Or, I mean, what, what will happen? Yes, because it will not send a decision, so coordinator aborts the message. Yeah, so if, uh, basically it can, it can locally decide to abort, and uh, the, the coordinator will, will abort the transaction. 
Uh, race. Um, okay, so this this is all. Uh, if the server receives a uh, a commit message, a commit message from the subordinate, or a commit a yes response from the subordinate, uh, the subordinate can always recover back to the point where uh, it crashed. I'm sorry, where it sent that commit message, uh, and if it receives a no message, the entire thing will abort, so there's no problems. Uh, what happens if the, um, why is it okay for the subordinate to decide to abort immediately after it sends back an abort message? So if, uh, slides. Uh, Right, so um, recall, I, I mentioned, I'd get back to this. Uh, the subordinate decides to, uh, when the subordinate, before the subordinate sends a message, it first logs either prepare or abort. Is it, what happens if the, uh, the subordinate, so the, the abort message, this is basically saying the transaction will be aborted. Is that okay? Just because even if one subordinate says no, the transaction final decision will be Exactly. So um, as as soon as that as soon as the uh, subordinate responds no, or even if it that no never actually reaches the server, um, then it is impossible for this transaction to ever be committed. Um, Okay, good. So we can recover from phase one. What about phase two? So what happens, uh, so from the, the client's perspective, when, when does it transition into phase two? Okay, so when it, as soon as it receives either a commit or an abort message uh, from the coordinator. Uh, what happens if it crashes immediately after receiving uh, a commit message or an abort message from the uh, from the coordinator. So it loses that message, or it, it, what do we need to do in order to, uh, to, to recover the client from that? So we, hmm? Well, the client can't log any, uh, the client can't log a message that it's never received. But is, uh, so, this is actually one place where the uh, recovery protocol has to do something uh, extra. What, what can we do? Uh, re, uh, what do you mean by re-receive? Uh, the client, well, so the message gets sent once by the coordinator in, in the protocol that I described. But, at, uh, Maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding. I, I think you're you're saying it sounds like you're saying the right thing. I, I, I just uh, can you restate it, perhaps? Yeah, uh, exactly. So the coordinator uh, the coordinator has to base as soon as the coordinator uh, decides to commit, and as soon as the coordinator uh, sends one commit message, uh, it needs to keep sending commit messages. Uh, to to a client, um, so the 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 coordinator needs to keep track of which transactions are still active, and which clients have acknowledged that that trend. Or sorry, which subordinates have acknowledged that that transaction uh, is is still pending, uh, has completed and, and been evaluated locally. Um, this is a bit of an overhead, but. Typically, clients aren't going to fail, so it's not a huge deal. Um, yeah. And if the, uh, the the failure happens to occur after the client logs a commit record, then standard Aries will, will bring you back to uh, the current state. All right. Uh, okay. So let's uh, more things. And then we're, we're through the, the sort of central bit of, of this. Um, the 
So the coordinator in this in this protocol acts as, as a bit of a blocker. Um, if the coordinator coordinator happens to fail uh, during the, the commit protocol, then everyone has to wait for the coordinator or the coordinator uh, to come back up. So something uh, a, a strategy people have, have come up with is something called three-phase commit, where the coordinator inserts sort of a, a phase one and a half, uh, where it first indicates to all of the nodes that the coordinator is ready to commit. As soon as a node receives a pre-commit message, then that means that the coordinator is, is ready to commit. And the coordinator is now going to uh, wait for n acknowledgments from all, uh, or n is, is related to the, the number of failures that can occur. Um, waits for n of the subordinates to acknowledge the pre-commit uh, before moving on to the commit phase. Uh, so, so how, do, how, does this, how does this help us? Well, um, as soon as n nodes have, re have acknowledged receiving a pre-commit, then any of those n nodes uh, can take over as the coordinator. So any of those nodes uh, can, can forward out a commit message uh, after, uh, after that happens. And because the coordinator only needs to wait for uh, a couple of acknowledgments, this doesn't introduce a huge amount of overhead. Um, yeah. So that's basically the three-phase commit protocol. Um, adds a little bit of overhead to runtime, but it also means that any of the, uh, any of the nodes that have received a pre-commit message uh, can take over uh, before, uh, can take over as coordinator. Uh, okay, um, one last bit, and that's basically going to be that, uh, as I said, if we're doing replication, we can. The naive strategy for for doing replication is uh, is to simply treat each replica as as a different site that the transaction is modifying. Uh, but you know, something to note is that even if a if a um, if some fraction of the, the, the nodes that are, uh, sorry, even if some fraction of the replicas of a particular object um, receive updates and, and are successfully able to log those updates locally, then um, those, those replicas can be used to recover any sort of operations that uh, weren't successfully applied to other replicas. Basically, any, any replica can, can reconstruct any, any changes that were applied to it since it failed from all of the other replicas. And so we can, uh, we can use this to simplify the two-phase commit protocol uh, by limiting how many, uh, how many responses we need to wait for. Pretty much in the same way that we do, uh, that we only wait for some number of acknowledgments. Um, in the three-phase commit protocol, we can basically say, okay, uh, as soon as n of the nodes are uh, have have acknowledged, we oh, sorry n uh, as soon as n plus one nodes have acknowledged, then any n nodes in the system uh, can fail, and we'll still have at least one node that can reconstruct the current state of of that that object. Is that clear? All right. Uh, so any any questions? Any questions on project three? All right, well, it's uh, raining a little early. Uh, next week, move on to more crazy stuff uh, like column stores and data warehousing.